this is from the book of Revelation the little open book and the two witnesses Revelation lesson 14 or 26 Revelation chapters 10 and 11 in two parts this is part one of two by me Ellis Jones lesson text Revelation 10 10 and 11 I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it and in my mouth it was sweet as honey and when I had eaten it my stomach was made bitter and they said to me you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings Introduction The Reformers Wycliffe and Hose The midway point in the vision will be reached in these two chapters, which really could be one chapter. The strong angel with the little open book and the two witnesses symbolize the great changes that take place in the world in the 15th through 18th centuries. Actually, there's an overlap, as there is with many visions, because the beginning of the Reformation can be dated to the time of Wycliffe. He died in 1384, and Hus, who died in 1415, who were contemporaries in the early Reformation. Wycliffe made the first English translation. In other words, it translated the Bible into the English language, the first one to do that. Here's the angel, the strong angel that stood on the land and on the sea with a little open book, of course, which was an unrolled scroll. Revelation 10, 1 through 3. I saw another strange, strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. Notice it says the rainbow. I don't know what the difference is. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire meaning actually his legs were like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open, a scroll which was unrolled. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Another strong angel. The first angel John described as a strong angel was the one who shouted out the question asking who was worthy to break the seven seals and unroll the scroll of the future. That was in chapter 5, verse 2. It seems the two strong angels have something to do with scrolls or books in some versions being opened and revealed. We will meet the last angel called in this book the strong angel in chapter 18, verse 21. Here we have a different different artist conception. The legs do not look like pillars of fire here, I don't think, but anyway, we can imagine they, might, they do. This strong angel must be a visual representation of the covenants of God, his laws and guidance. These must represent the Bible and its restoration to the common people, an open book, and it was given to John to reveal again to many peoples, many lands, kings, and peoples. Clothed with a cloud means he represents heavenly things. The rainbow on his head from the covenant with mankind through Noah represents his covenant faithfulness. God's covenant. His face and voice. His face like the sun represents the word of God providing spiritual light for the world just as the sun provides light for the physical world. The lion roar voice represents the authority of the Lion of Judah, Jesus. So this book has the authority of Jesus and that's what our Bible of course has. These symbols and those to come show that the meaning 
is the restoration of the authority of the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice for the church. The pillars of fire, his legs were like pillars of his feet, but it means the legs were like pillars of fire. The feet or legs like pillars of fire is from the covenant with Israel made in the wilderness of Sinai where the angel guided the nation 40 years by a pillar of fire and cloud. His feet and legs symbolize God's guiding his covenant people through this, through this world. He placed one foot on the land and one on the sea. This means the little book he holds contains the covenant and revelation of the will of God as well as the future events that God wishes to be revealed. The, the gospel for the world, a world soon to be expanded. In other words, a universal message, a universal message and a, a application. Remember the pillar of fire in the wilderness? At night there was a pillar of fire. In the daytime it was a pillar of cloud. So let's go to the next slide. The little open book, well, this because does not look like the book John saw. John saw a scroll, which, were, which was the book in those days. In his hand, this angel had a little book, and it was open. This is a Bible, soon to be translated into the people's languages. Free access to the Word of God, after it has so long been obscured in Latin and kept from the common people, fills the people with joy, sweet in the mouth, but obeying it will bring bitter persecution from the papal empire. Applying it to your life is digesting it. John heard seven peals of thunder. Revelation 10, 3 through 4. He cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And of course, these were words that they said very loud, authoritative words, but not words of God. These were evidently the en enemies of the reformers who were pronouncing condemnation, words of condemnation against them. So since these were not words of God, God told, him not, God told, God told John not to record them. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. The Seven Peals of Thunder Peals of the Thunder have represented the voice of God throughout the Bible history. If these peals of thunder were the voice of God, one wonders why the angel would not let John tell what they said. In the case of these sounds, perhaps they were the voice of one attempting to speak, speak for God without his authority. This man, or these church councils, claim to speak for God, but his or their words do not agree with the scriptures and are not God's words. The Church Councils There were many, more than seven ex cathedra pronouncements of the popes and more than seven councils of the Roman Catholic Church through the years. But if the number seven in this case, as in the case of seven churches, means a complete number, it represents the idea of men speaking for God and making laws for the church without his authority. This is a problem the coming series of visions will address and the restoration of the Bible to the people will correct.
United Opposition. I believe the seven, hun seven thunders which symbolize the universal united opposition of the enemies of the Bible to its translation and promulgation to the common people of the world. These voices are the very ones that will bring the bitterness to the stomach of the prophet. The bitterness in the stomach represents the suffering that will come to whomever stands up for religious liberty. Revelation 10, 5 through 7. Then the angel, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he pre preached to his servants, the prophets. The Seventh Trumpet Some have thought this seventh trumpet is the last trump that Jesus said would signal his second coming. I'm not sure this is the meaning. I think he means the series of visions that begin at the signal of the seventh trumpet will finish the revelation. The mystery of God is what is not understood until it is revealed. It will be revealed, then it will not be a mystery. He preached to his servants. God preached to his servants the prophets. The things that will soon be revealed in coming chapters are the very things God revealed to men like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah, as we will see. The heavenly city, its temple, its symbolic resurrection, and the coming of Gog and Magog, God revealed to Ezekiel, along with some other things we will discuss. In chapter 11 are adaptations of several things God revealed to Zechariah. And of course, the beasts and the power of the papacy were revealed to Daniel. They're coming in chapter 13 through 17. We see Jesus near on the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem speaking to his disciples. The writers of the New Testament were prophets too, all of them. And we should remember that the writers of the New Testament were all prophets too, and God had preached to them, pre the preached to them in the person of His Son. By now, but now, by means of the invention of the printing press, the brave men who translated the Bible into the languages of the peoples and led the people in accepting it, the little this little book was again open, thanks to in large part to the truth revealed in John's final book. Here we have John on the island of Patmos receiving the, the, receiving the visions and seeing what God wants to reveal to him and to us. John had prof prophesied to his own generation in the Greek language, which his readers understood at the time, but at a time in the future he would again prophesy to and concerning many peoples and like nations and kings and tongues in his languages. John is prophesying right now to us in this class in our language because his words have been translated from the Greek and he is prophesying concerning things that are happening in our own generation and things that will still that are still to come. the fanciful vision of Isaiah 11, the peaceable kingdom, when the lion will lie down with the lamb and so forth. Delay no longer, mystery accomplished. 
What will happen in the days of the little book and the seventh trumpet is the restoration of the Bible's authority and with it the church kingdom after many years of oppression by the papal powers and the governments of the world dominated by the popes. This mystery will be accomplished in the days of the seventh trumpet. Here we have a uh, some slogans that were used in the restoration in the, in the restoration movement. Obey God's silence. Where the Bible is silent, we should be silent. We do not make laws where God did not make them. We do not bind anything on people that God has not bound. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. This is the peaceable kingdom of Isaiah 11 and the kingdom Daniel saw restored in Daniel 7. It's the house of the Lord that Isaiah and Micah saw as revealed in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, the restored church of Christ. Reformation did not work. It, it worked to a certain extent. It brought us along but did not go far enough. It did not restore, reform the Catholic Church. You cannot reform the Catholic Church to make it like the, to the New Testament church. We had to go back to the beginning and start over, getting rid of all man-derived na names and teachings and reestablish the original teachings of the New Testament. That alone will re recreate the true church. The little open book, which of course was a scroll. Revelation 10, 8 and 9. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again, speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make you make your stomach bitter but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. There's a golden altar of incense. It was in the tabernacle. The voice John heard before was the voice from among the horns of the golden altar of incense. I understand this voice to represent the prayers of the saints eager to learn the truth of God's word being answered. Remember the incense represented the prayers of the saints with the Holy Spirit intercession, the power of the Holy Spirit in intercession. John obeys the voice and takes and eats the little book. See Jeremiah 15, 16, something similar happened there. If you'd like to pause and go there and look it up, I'd suggest you do that. It is by his work that the little open book is restored to the masses who by this time were eager to know the truth and to spread it through the old and new worlds. Here we have honey on the left, which is sweet, and wormwood, which is bitter, on the right. One represents the wonder, the joy of getting the truth, knowing the truth. The other is the bitterness of what, what happens to you when you obey the truth in a world where they will not accept Christian behavior. Revelation 10, 10 and 11. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, they, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. We have reached a kind of midpoint in these revelations. Now for the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Here we have uh, one of the foremost reformers, Martin Luther. The Fulfillment of the Vision According to B.W. Johnson, the vision of the strong angel with a little book open means the beginnings of the Reformation movement. Here is his explanation. 
Beginning in the early part of the 16th century, within a short time of the date already reached, 1453, that was the fall of Constantinople and the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, was a movement which corresponds fully to the symbols. Indeed, the Reformation might be said to have begun earlier with Wycliffe and Hoos, but was fully inaugurated in the 13th, 16th century. Uh, uh, Wycliffe translated the Bible in 1330, somewhere along in there, so and, uh, about a century, a little bit more than a century earlier. That was actually the beginning. He's called the morning star of the Reformation. The book was locked up in ancient languages or languages that the common people didn't understand. It was a movement, number one, in which Christ comes in spirit, came in spirit. Two, a movement full of peace and hope. Three, a movement to diffuse light. Four, a movement for the whole world. Remember the, the face of the angel was like the sun shining. A movement for the whole world. The angel was standing on the land and the sea. A movement due to the influence of the open book which of course would be the Bible, in the language of the people so they could read it. That's how it was open. The Reformation was the work of a book. Whatever the Romish clergy may pretend now, I mean, we're, we're quoting B.W. Johnson, there is no doubt that before the Reformation they had taken the Bible from the people. The whole influence of the Catholic Church was opposed to its circulation, and in many instances persons have been burned for no other crime than having the Bible in their houses. The book was left sealed up in dead languages and was impossible for it to be read in the native tongue of any European people. This radiant angel, however, has in his hand a book open, significant of the fact that in God's providence, the Reformation should present the New Testament open to the world. Might say the angel represents the Reformation movement. More meanings. This is a, an old printing press. I think this is the kind that we call the offset press. I agree in most things with Johnson, but I think it was more than just the Reformation movement. It was the Renaissance, which began in 1453, invention of printing, 1456, and with the wide dissemination of the Bible in the languages of the people, the open book, and discovery of the New World, 1492, the feat on land and sea, which gave a great impetus to freedom of religion, accelerated the loss of power of the Roman Catholic Church and ultimately restored the New Testament Church. Of course, the Bible did have a great part in that, especially in the languages that the people could read. John gets the measuring read. What is a measuring read? Isn't that also the Bible? Another figure of the Bible. The angel represents the authority of God expressed in his word, restored to the people in the Bible, made accessible to all peoples in their languages. Now we go on to other visions of the great measuring read of the Bible used to restore the biblical teachings that will identify the true church of Christ on earth and the true worshipers who are the two witnesses that we will see. This two witnesses symbolize the true worshipers, the church as the two witnesses, which, is, which was uh, legally demanded to establish the truth of anything, required two or three witnesses.
to it the minimum. The mean, the measuring begins. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, Gentiles, some versions say, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Some versions say trample. 42 months is the same as the 16, uh, 12, 1260 years for the time, times, and half a time of the prophecy. So many of the prophecies, Daniel and Revelation, give the same period of time, which we would call a great tribulation. Or I would call it a great tribulation. I know the premillennialist people don't don't think it that way. The measuring reed. This reed, canon in Greek, is another symbol for the word of God by which we are to measure the church, the temple that is, and its members. These are the teachings that tell us what the church is or what it should look like doctrinally the teachings that describe what those who belong to the true church of Christ are to believe and do. Note that it was not the angel that measured, but a man. We may use the same measure, God's word. If we've been given that measure to measure ourselves as well as the church. The system of worship. The temple, altar, court, and city. What did each represent? Here we have the brass altar and the priest going up to it to offer sacrifices. The temple in this symbolic picture is the restored church. The altar means the belief and practices of the members, worshippers, their life of sacrifice, the living sacrifice. The court means the apostate church here called symbolically the Gentiles or the nations that will trample the holy city for the 42 months or 1260 years of prophetic time. Jesus spoke of this and called it the times of the Gentiles, Luke 21, 24. Only true priests could go up to in the, into the temple. Those who are not priests stayed in the court. All, the Christ, all Christians, all true Christians are priests. The measuring according to Johnson. This prediction will be fulfilled if under the sixth trumpet before the seventh is blown a corrupted church corrupted during long ages of apostasy shall be compared with some divine standard. Or in other words after 1453 there ought to be an effort to reform the church and to conform it to the New Testament. Let us ask, who shall measure the church? It has been measured for hundreds of years, not by the Bible, but by the decrees of councils and by the decision of popes. There was during all this time a voice almost suppressed asking that it be measured by the divine standard, but it was stifled this prophecy, however, implies a movement of commanding power which shall seek to apply the divine reed to the measurement of the church. What Johnson calls a movement of commanding power, I call the voice of the people. Note that the voice came from the golden altar of incense, which is the symbol of the prayers of the saints and all Christians are saints. 1 Corinthians 1. 
At the time of the Renaissance and Reformation, there was a rising tide of sentiment of people in almost every so-called Christian nation to return to the New Testament as the only source of authority in faith and practice for the church. Who now, according to John, we're back to quoting uh, Johnson now, who now, according to John, shall make the measurement? What shall be the standard? Not popes, not councils, not of apostolic fathers, but the reed is given to an apostle, the living representative of the apostolic body. The twelve to whom are given twelve thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel, the apostles, shall also measure the church of Jesus Christ in the day signal signified by the symbolism, symbolism employed. We have the books of the New Testament on the left. The New Testament is the authority, not the Old Testament. How? The reader, the, the reed was not their own creation, but was given to them. There is but one divine measure that has ever been given. The New Testament, written by apostles, given to them by inspiration, is a divine standard with which the church, the worship, and the worshipers must be tested. No, not the traditions of men, not the decision of councils, not the decrees of synods or conferences, not the creeds of any uninspired body that ever met on the face of the earth, but the standard measure is the New Testament. The true church, according to Johnson. This is not the only place where the reed is named as the appointed instrument for the measurement of the church. If the reader will turn to the 21st chapter, he will find that the New Te Jerusalem, the holy city, is measured by an angel with a golden reed. In Ezekiel chapter 40, the prophet sees an angel measure with a reed a temple such as never been seen by mortal vision. Now this is evidently in heaven. The earthly church is measured by men using the reed that was given them by from heaven, but the holy city itself is, is a measure made, uh, given by, or made by the angel. View of the sanct sanctuary of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 40, chapter 40 through chapter 47. A very unusual architecture there for a temple. The temple itself is just equal to the measure, and it's composed of many chambers, all equal in size to the reed, to each other, and to the temple itself of which they are parts. Now that's a strange measure, isn't it? That every the temple itself and each of its parts is equal to the measure, the reed, the, the length of the reed. This strange symbolism, this representation of what is apparently impossible, most beautifully represents the, ch the character of the true church when it has reached the fullness of divine measure and appears as a new Jerusalem. Ezekiel's temple, the view of the outer court. The whole temple is just the size, neither larger nor smaller than the reed. That's the New Testament. The true church corresponds exactly with the divine measure of the word. It neither adds to itself things unknown to the apostle nor omits the things therein enjoined. As the temple of Ezekiel was composed of chambers, each of which was the same size as the temple, so the church is composed of many congregations, each of which should correspond exactly to the measure of the whole body. One body is equal to 
every other body. Our headquarters is in heaven. We have no earthly head or no earthly headquarters. Our headquarters is in heaven. Each church is autonomous. These individual congregations which make up the spiritual temple should not differ from each other in name, in creeds, in rites, in observances, as do the sects of modern times. In the true church, when fully restored, there will be one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one hope, one name, one practice. Ephesians 4.4 4. Johnson on the Fulfillment. Here we have a chart of the Reformation, starting with Luther. It actually started before that, but this chart starts with Luther. The symbolism recorded by the Apostle evidently described the measurement of the church, its worship, and the, of its worshipers by the divine standard of the New Testament. Our next inquiry is whether history records the fulfillment do we find aught in history subsequent to 1453 which can be regarded as fulfillment of the prophecy? The Door and the Theses. These are the 95 Theses. Supposedly you can't read them. Very too, print's too small, but this represents the 95 Theses that Luther nailed to the door for the chapel in Wittenberg. Earlier reformers such as Waldo, Wycliffe, and Huss made an attempt to reform the church, but the whole world dates the beginning of the, the Protestant Reformation with Luther. It was in 1517 that he nailed to the door of the church in Wittenberg his theses by which he broke with Rome. These were these were disagreements with the teachings of the Roman Church. Catechism of the Catholic Church. It was held by the papacy, which then lorded over Christendom, that the writings of the fathers, tradition, and the decrees of councils were not only an additional measure, but might even set aside the word of God. The Great Reformation planted itself upon the principles maintained by Martin Luther, and the cornerstone of Protestantism is that the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice of the Christian Church. Protestantism has not always been true to its principles, but it has always conceded that the final standard of measurement is the Word of God. There's a lot of uh, misinterpretation or different interpretations, but they've always agreed that that's it. Except, you know, the, the majority of Christendom. Some cults do not agree with that. They have prophets who teach something different. Here we see the two witnesses two olive trees and the two lampstands. This was first revealed in Zechariah, book of Zechariah. Revelation 11, 3 through 5. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. In other words, there would be in a miserable condition to be persecuted. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way.
to the two witnesses by two witnesses. The idea of two witnesses is that no testimony was valid except when given by at least two witnesses. Matthew 18:16. that was actually from the Old Testament, but it, Jesus brought it forward into the New Testament. These witnesses speak with the authority of God. They are persecuted during the 42 months or 1260 prophetic years already mentioned. Therefore, they are prophesying in sackcloth, a symbol of suffering. The French Revolution Their power Their enemies kill them, symbolically, and for three and a half years in the French Revolution they were killed. But the witnesses, raised from death and caught up to heaven, ultimately succeeded in killing also, in a symbolic sense, those who had killed them. Maybe by this time you have guessed that, it, that I think the witnesses are the true church of God. Their testimony is the, their faith in the Bible as the word of God. Some people think it's the Old and New Testaments, but I believe it's just the Bible, Bible itself, uh, specifically the New Testament. Conclusion. Now we're going to get into the two witnesses and so forth in part two. So, in these visions, we see the church restored as God's witness to the peoples. The little book of the New, is the New Testament is once again opened to the common people by the Reformation preachers, although it took much pain and suffering to open it and keep it open. In our next lesson, France, the leading power of Europe, will try to kill the church and close the word of God to mankind. They will be successful for a short time, three and a half years. But these two, the church and the Bible, will come back even stronger, never to be hidden or closed again. Questions for discussion. What did the little open book signify? How was eating, this, eating it sweet in the mouth but bitter in the stomach? Discuss. If you need time to discuss it or think about it, hit the pause button. What did the angel, his sunshine face, and the rainbow around his head mean? Discuss. What is the significance of the fact that he stood on the land and sea? Discuss. What is the significance of the number two when used of witnesses? Discuss that also. What did the two witnesses probably signify? The Open Book, a poem by Ellis Jones. For many years, God's book was closed to most people of the world. Till one, till on the beast and man of sin, God's thunderbolts were hurled. For 1260 years, the world in darkness lay. Then Wycliffe and his kind arose and chased the night away. That means the translation of the Bible given to the people in their own language so they could read it and understand it. God's everlasting gospel saves and has not changed, re reconciling God and man so they are not estranged. God's book forever opened will not be closed again. In every tongue it's read today by every race of men. Next lesson will be the little open book and the two witnesses. Part 2 of 2, Revelation 10 and 11. The End 
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. And have a good day and see you next time.